right, so what we're going to pick up with um, is the exercise physiology. How do we actually maintain physiological hygiene of our 11 organ systems? Um, and, and really what I want to start out with is, is this description or this definition of uh, physical activity, exercise, fitness, and begin to kind of flesh out those terms because they're actually all very much different. Now, when we consider physical activity, physical activity is actually uh, a term that occurs on a continuum. And I've given you a picture of the continuum here. And this continuum basically goes from physical inactivity to becoming physically active to then using exercise to enhance your overall wellness, your overall health, and your overall fitness. So there are typically, for most uh, most definitions, three different levels of uh, physical activity on this continuum. Okay, and we start out with level zero. So really, the first level, level zero, it's inactivity, which you can see over here, and it has no health. So an individual who's in this level zero, who's sedentary, takes a lot of seat, uh, takes a lot of time sitting, doesn't really engage in much physical activity, and is going to gain no additional health benefits. In other words, our physiological systems are going to degrade rather than have improvement in their overall function. So individuals in this part of the continuum are going to be illness prone. Okay, so illness crown. Our second level, what I'm going to call level one, is classically going to be defined as physical activity itself. Okay, so what does it look like when an individual moves into this perspective of the continuum, moves up to being physically active? Well, first of all, what we're going to find out is that physical activity is going to require movement. So to be physically active, you have to be up and you have to be moving. And in terms of that movement, you are going to utilize energy. So we're tapping into the, the metabolism and the biochemistry of the different cells and tissues of our organs. So movement requires energy. Physical activity is primarily going to be centered around the utilization of our skeletal muscle, but also is going to affect cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, in increasing the amount of stress that's placed on all of the other physiological systems. So even when you exercise, we have changes in the physiology of the skin. We have a lot of changes that occur in the physiology of the lymphatic system and the immune system. So all of these changes in all of the different physiological systems, all the different organ systems, are primarily being affected by the processes occurring within the skeletal muscle. Now, when we look at this physical activity continuum, what you're seeing in this picture here is you have a lady who's walking a dog. These folks down here in this uh, cartoon are, are um, they're gardening or working around the house. Off there you are. This fella looks like he's walking to work. Um, to get to to get to his job, those are known as lifestyle activities. Okay, so lifestyle activity. So when you start to incorporate physical activity, it's going to have some benefits. You have to sort of look out and look at your day and figure out how can I how can I bring in more activity. How can I bring in more physical activity? One of the places that you can do that is your life, your daily life tasks, things that you have to do, whether it's walking up to your class, walking instead of driving, or walking up to the calf, or um, going to the grocery store, going to your job, and, and using alternative modes of transportation, like bicycle or, or foot travel. By incorporating that type of physical activity known as lifestyle activity, we gain health benefits. So this will promote your health, but not necessarily improve your fitness. So I want you to recognize that health and fitness, and then another term, wellness, 
these are different things. Um, and as you move from one portion of the continuum to the other side of the port, or to the other side of the continuum, what we're going to see is we're going to see changes in health. And then we're going to begin to see changes in wellness. And then we're going to be able to begin to see changes in fitness as well. So lifestyle activity, gardening, walking your dog, walking to work, this promotes your health and gains health benefits, but it doesn't necessarily improve your fitness. You're not going to be able to run fast. You're not going to be able to lift the weight. Those are characteristics of fitness. But your heart's going to function better. Your immune system is going to function better. You're going to have all sorts of improvements in those physiological systems that are going to be very beneficial. So lifestyle physical activity, again, is used in everyday activity. And the examples that we have already provided are things like walking to work or maybe we'll say to class. And that should have a to walking to work, walking to class. Things like gardening or working around your home, heading over to the grocery store, do your grocery shopping. So even though it's probably pretty funny, when you and your friends go to Walmart to ride one of those carts instead of walking around the store, um, those carts are going to be real inhibitors of your lifestyle. Uh, activity or your, your ability to participate in lifestyle activity and, and gain some of those benefits. So what's recommended here um, for your daily lifestyle activity? So it might be here on campus for you walking to class, walking to the cafeteria. Um, it might include, uh, you know, doing some stuff around your dorm, cleaning your room, whatever. They recommend 30 minutes of lifestyle physical activity in order to gain and promote some health benefits to the physiological system. As you increase not only the lifestyle physical activity, but then also defined the physical activity, maybe it's going out for a walk, which is not something that you incorporate into going from point A to point B, but you're just going for a walk. Maybe with that special something. Perhaps your dog. If you can get 45 minutes or more, what you're actually going to begin to see is not only that promotion of health, but you're also going to begin to tap into some of the weight management abilities of physical activity. It's going to be easier for you to maintain your body weight. Maybe you can become a little bit easier if you need to lose a little bit of your body weight for that to happen. So that's physical activity and then lifestyle physical activity kind of incorporated in there. And then what you see as you continue further up the continuum, we move into this area that's called exercise. So finally our third level, what we're going to call level two, zero is inactivity. Physical activity level one, level two, we're going to call it exercise. Now, that exercise, all exercise is a type of physical activity. That's why we have it on a physical activity team. But not all physical activity is exercise. Exercise is a little bit different by definition. Exercise is a type of physical activity that's planned and structured. It's going to involve repetitive movements. And in doing the repetitive movements, it's going to tax the body or stress the physiological systems, and you're going to begin to gain additional benefits. So what's the difference between going out for a walk, that's physical activity, and something that would be exercise? Exercise would be, I'm going to run for 30 minutes today. And you have that plan, you have the structure, you know when you're going to do it. It's more intentional than, hey, let's go for a walk. Walking is good, and it's going to have a benefit, but it's a physical activity benefit, whereas the exercise is planned, 
it's designed for you to specifically do that task when you're out for a walk, you're usually engaging in conversation or something like that. Walking can become physical activity, though. You might say, I'm going to walk aggressively, or I'm going to walk vigorous, aggressive walking. So it's a lot of fun, right? So with exercise, we have even more health benefits. We improve overall wellness and quality of life. But then there's one last area where physical activity uh, that's called exercise is going to have a major benefit. And that's increasing what we call physical fitness. Okay, so increasing physical fitness comes alongside the use of daily exercise in your daily routine. Physical fitness is going to include the physical attributes of the individual. So here with physical fitness, we're actually going to see things like reductions in your resting heart, increases in muscle strength and efficiency, increased immune system responsiveness. So the physiological system, in terms of health, we maintain a good function with health. With physical fitness, we're improving those physical characteristics or those physical capabilities. So physical fitness is really this measure of your responsiveness to physical stress. So your responsiveness to physical stress. So exercise is a physical stress. And as you exercise, and we're going to talk more about this, you have changes that are called adaptations to those physiological systems that helps you accommodate that stress better. Right? If I all have you all stand up right now, you're all sedentary, right? Let's assume you're all sedentary. I know that's not true. Well, let's say you're sedentary, and you're like, all right, let's go run a mile. Here you go and run that mile. Some of you will probably have to stop and walk. Maybe some of you will run really well. For a few minutes, make it a little bit harder. You go out and you run, and you get a certain time. That's a measure of your physical fitness. It's an overall measure of how well your body responds to that stress, how well it responds. Exercise will actually increase your physical fitness, will change your ability to respond. And hopefully with exercise, if you run a 15 minute mile, incorporate some exercise, you get it down to 10 minutes. The more, you get down to five minutes. Some more physical fitness, pretty soon you're world record hold in the mile. You always get the point. So physical fitness is this characteristic of the physical attributes, and we use exercise to improve physical fitness by improving physical fitness. Not only are you able to not maintain health, but actually can improve health as well. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how can you improve your physical fitness are there good, succinct ways, so as you finish up your college career and you go on to become an English teacher, wherever you're going, that you actually can continue to maintain and improve your health and gain those benefits. So how, in other words, do we improve physical fitness? Is there a really simple, fast trick that we can use? And the answer is there's a really fast trick that we can use to model what you should be doing but all of the work is going to be your responsibility. There's no such thing as a magic pill that's going to make us all physically fit and healthy. But physical fitness and improving physical fitness is one of those ways to really enhance our health, our wellness, and our overall quality of life. So first I want to introduce you to some more characteristics of physical fitness. So right now, all of you have a certain physical fitness. Some of you probably have a high fitness level. Some of you probably have a low fitness level. Physical fitness characteristics are always exercise 
induced. So if we want to make changes to our physical fitness, it has to come from exercise. So the exercise induced characteristics. When you exercise, you increase your fitness. You increase that responsiveness to stress. But in addition to the increase in responsiveness with physical fitness, physical fitness is also defined in your athletic ability. Or what we might call skills. So exercise induced is a um, exercise induced characteristics means that you have increases in fitness, but fitness is also going to have a component of athletic ability and skills. And both of them are actually trainable. Lastly, physical fitness is going to, as you increase, lead towards promotion and health. Now, we could talk about the athletic abilities, things like eye hand coordination, balance, speed, agility, all of those can be trained and they can be improved, which will help you respond to the stress of exercise or the stress of physical effort. What I'm really interested in is the health promotion. I think probably most of you are not looking to become a little bit gap, think some of you are. Most of you are just looking to have a healthy life. A life filled with health and joy and hope and happiness. And I firmly believe that if you can improve your physical fitness, all of those things become more realistic. So I want to focus not on the skill set that's enhanced with exercise and improvements in fitness, but the health related components. And when we look at physical fitness and, and health promotion through physical fitness, we typically look at fitness through five health related components. It's five different factors. This picture here you can see actually shows the five different factors that make up physical fitness or health related physical fitness. So the five components are going to include cardiorespiratory endurance, how well can you adapt to and handle prolonged large muscle dynamic stress or exercise. So cardiorespiratory endurance is a measure of prolonged large muscle dynamic exercise. And guess what? Individuals who have car higher cardiorespiratory endurance fitness have lower rates of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, certain types of cancer. So building your cardiorespiratory endurance through physical activity and uh, exercise is actually going to improve your resistance to many of the chronic diseases that face our culture and our population today. And the reason that we're paying $350 billion every year to cover the cost of health care. In addition to cardiorespiratory endurance, we can also evaluate muscle strength. And muscle strength is a measure of fitness that deals with the muscle force production, the ability of a muscle to produce force. Typically measured just in uh, terms of um, weight training, typically measured by this thing called the one rep max or the one RM. So you go in and put up 225 pounds on the bench press and you get it one time, that's your one rep max. And that's a measurement, a quantification of your physical fitness when it comes to your muscle strength. Increasing muscle strength increases your ability to handle nutrition, especially things like glucose and sugar. It helps you to uh, be more resistant to, to diabetes and other nutritional, um, uh, nutritionally related diseases. 
It's also going to increase muscle strength. It's also going to increase your metabolism. It actually helps with all the weight there. And you're not bought with obesity. The third component is muscle endurance. And this is a little bit different than muscle strength. This is a measure of the muscle's ability to handle prolonged or repeated muscle contraction. So prolonged or repeated muscle contraction. So if we measure this, we typically will have individuals go into a weight room or can even do it without weight equipment and put on a certain weight and say, okay, let's do as many pranks as you can, do as many push-ups as you can, do as many pull-ups as you can. And that's a measure of muscle endurance. How well does the muscle respond to that prolonged or that repeated muscle contraction? How efficient is that muscle? The more efficient that muscle is, the better disease resistance you have, the better, more efficient your muscles are using metabolic processes. So it's good to have muscle endurance. The next component is a component called flexibility. Now, at the very onset here, I want to I make a quick clarification. Most of you have probably just thought, oh, stretching. Flexibility is not stretching. Flexibility is actually going to be a measurement of the joint's ability to move through a full range of motion. So the joint's movement through a full range of motion. As you increase range of motion, motion alongside strength of that joint, you reduce risk for injury, okay? Now, some of you would argue, okay, flexibility can be achieved by stretching, and you're probably thinking of all the things you don't touch with um, We're gonna talk more about that, and I'm probably gonna surprise some of you because stretching is terrible for you. But there are ways that we can train our flexibility where we can actually improve not only the range of motion through the joint, but the strength, reducing risk for injury. Number one risk for injury in female soccer players is over, is over um, flexibility juxtaposed to weakness. Um, number one injury is usually ACL. Did we talk about ACL? And you had ACL already. And I basically knew exactly how it happened. Guys don't get any ACL injuries near as much as women. And part of that is because of the difference in strength. Range of motion plus strength is going to improve your resistance to energy. Uh, injury. Resistance to injury. So we'll talk about some flexibility as well. Um, so the last component here is not body, body. Body composition. Body composition is our final health-related component. And body composition is just simply a measurement of a ratio or a quantity of fat versus fat-free body mass. So a ratio of fat to fat-free body mass. Within limits, there is a lower limit and there is definitely an upper limit. We want to have a ratio of fat to fat-free mass where we have a much higher percentage of fat-free mass, things like muscle and other organs, as opposed to adipose tissue or to fat. So we'll talk a little bit about body composition as well. All right, so those are our five different areas around this, this diagram here of health-related components of fitness. Each one of these health-related components of fitness can actually be trained. You can improve cardiorespiratory endurance. You can improve muscle strength, muscle endurance, flexibility, and body composition. And as you improve each of these areas, that's called increasing physical fitness, which is synonymous with reducing your risk for all types of chronic diseases.
which by the way, if we reduce chronic diseases, we're enhancing the function of the, of the physio physiological organ systems. Organ systems become diseased when they are not physically fit. So to prevent those diseases, we have to be physically fit. So how do we actually train, how do we tap into the natural system that exists that helps us to improve the overall fitness of our organ systems and the disease resistance? So whenever you train and you use physical activity and exercise, you're causing what's known as adaptation. And adaptation is a very common thing within the biological world. If I turn the lights off or I turn the lights on, you adapt to the new amount of light that's in the air. Pupils may dilate they may constrict. So you're responding to an external stimuli. When we train, we also respond to an external stimuli. And when we respond, that adaptation, it occurs in predefined specific ways. So the first thing that happens in terms of adaptation to fitness is it occurs specifically, or there's a specificity that occurs. And what specificity means is that the type of demand that you put on the body is going to determine the adaptation or the specific adaptation that will occur. So if I go out of the weight room, and I just live bench press all day long, are my leg muscles going to get bigger? Are they? They're not going to because I'm using specificity to increase an upper body muscle. So specificity is this idea that physical stress causes adaptation to the type of training that's done. So we specifically respond to stress, or we respond to stress in specific ways. And I can give you another example of this. If I turn the lights on right now, what's going to happen? All of you are probably going to go, and you're going to maybe swing your eyes a little bit, and the pupils will constrict, and then you'll be okay. That's a specific response to a specific stress. It would be very weird if I came in and turned the light on and all of you had an injury in place. That's not the right response, right? So you adapt specifically to that, that stress that you're, that you're responding to. The second, um, the second adaptation that occurs is what's known as progressive overload. And what you'll see on the figure that I have up here is progressive overload is actually split out into overload into progression. I like to put them together because they really are different sides of the same coin. So progressive overload is this idea that not only do we adapt specifically, but we adapt to the amount of stress that's placed on the body. So we're going to adapt to the amount of training. So if I'm already a pretty physically fit guy, and I use exercise training to try to improve my fitness, and I don't challenge my fitness, so I'm below my fitness stress, uh, my my fitness threshold, I'm not going to improve any of my physical fitness. I actually have to get above the stress that I can accommodate to begin to increase that progressive adaptation. So normally when we look at tapping into exercise and physical activity to improve overall physical fitness, we can use increasing amounts of stress to lead towards increased fitness. In other words, getting on your bike 
in riding at 10 miles an hour for 30 minutes every day is a stress that's consistent. And you're never really going to increase fitness beyond that level, beyond the level of what the stress of five miles an hour, 30 minutes causes. So when we look at uh, exercise and, and training for fitness, we want to see increases in stress. That's the idea of progressive overload. And we can manage progressive overload, this, this principle of adaptation, with this thing called the FIT principle. Some of you have probably already run into the FIT principle before. And this is just one of the ways in which you can manage progressive overload and use that to improve your physical fitness. I know for cross-country running, you have a training protocol and it's probably a more complex model than this. And um, has elements of the fit principle built in and if you got a great coach, that coach already knows what progressive overload is and knows how to utilize that to enhance your capabilities as a runner. But for the everyday consumer, the person who's just trying to lead a healthy, happy, hopeful life, the fit principle is a really simple approach to design of, uh, of an exercise protocol that will help you manage these stresses systematically to uh, adapt appropriately for health and, and, and um, wellness benefits. So FIT is an acronym. The F stands for frequency. And frequency is a measure of how often will you engage in exercise. How often are you engaging in that stress? The I is intensity. And intensity is a measure of how hard are you going to engage in that stress. And we're going to talk about each of these areas uh, as we go through. And we're going to talk about how do we manage frequency, how do we manage intensity, how do we change these things. The first T is time. How long? Will an exercise or a workout last? And they call this duration. And then lastly, the final T is type. And type is the mode of activity. So mode of activity, if I want to improve my cardiorespiratory endurance, I'm probably not going into the gym to lift. That's going to help me improve my muscle strength. And depending on how I do it, it might actually help me improve my muscle strength, my muscle endurance. If I want to improve cardiovascular endurance, running, walking, cycling, maybe kayaking down the river, which is one of my favorite activities. So the type of activity is going to help to uh, deal with this progressive overload and the, the principles of uh, uh, specific adaptation. Okay, so we got the FIT principle. We got frequency, intensity, time, and type to help us manage this idea of progressive overload. And the idea that as you increase stress, it also results in an increase in fitness. Now, there's one last principle here of ad uh, adaptability, adaptation. And it's a negative. The first two, the first three really here, and the two that I'm giving you specificity of the progressive overload are, are benefits. But there's also a adversity here for adaptability, and that's called reversibility. And I wish it wasn't the case. I wish that you could get to a certain level of fitness, and then you can just maintain. And you didn't have to do anything else. But what happens when you reduce the exposure to stress through physical activity and exercise is your fitness begins to drop back down. Physical exercise, uh, physical fitness is improved through exercise and physical activity because of specificity and progressive overload. The cessation of 
physical activity and exercise leads back towards a decrease in physical fitness. And that's called reversibility. Now, reversibility isn't really necessarily completely bad. In fact, there are good scientific reasons to incorporate some time of reversibility in your training. So this is the adapt adapting or adaptation to a reduction in training. Now, this reduction in training can actually be very beneficial for a short period of time, especially after you engage in high amounts of progressive overload. So really what I'm saying is when you look at your, your exercise, and maybe this is over a matter of weeks, week one, week two, week four, week three, week four, one, two, four. If you increase the amount of exercise, and this is the amount of exercise or the, the level of stress on, on the y-axis, that's progressive overload. You're progressively increasing that stress. And this is causing increases in physical fitness. But it also is causing injury and it's inducing a need for repair. And so if you have a fourth week where you go through reversibility for that week, it gives the body time to go through repair. You go through that repair, and the next set of four weeks, you might actually be able to increase even further and improve physical fitness and do more. So whenever you look at fitness and whenever you look at exercise and physical activity, really just like an artist starts out with a blank canvas and they put color on the blank, the physiologist looks at rest and puts activity in rest. And that rest time is what's going to aid in that reversibility to help out with repair of muscle, help out repair of other tissues. And then you move into the next kind of set of progressive overload, and you can actually increase it because you've improved fitness and had some time to, to, to heal to gain those benefits. However, if reversibility extends for a long period of time, you're going to have a continuation of that decrease in fitness, resulting from that decrease in stress. So initially, that decrease in stress is going to have some advantages. With prolonged decreases in stress, you have decrease in your overall fitness. So, like I said uh, just a few minutes ago, it would be great if you could go out, train physically, and you get to a certain point, and you're like, yeah, I'm running a five-minute mile. I'm in such good physical shape. And then, like, for the next 90 years, you just are able to continue to have that level of fitness. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So you stop exercising. What actually happens when you stop training? So when you stop training, you begin to go through reductions in fitness. Anyone have a guess how long it will take before you lose 50% of your game fitness? Two days. Two days. Wow. Hope not. It's actually two months. About 50, about 50 percent of your gains in fitness are going to be lost within two months. So within about two months. You're no longer that five minute miler, you're now a complete couch potato, you probably gain weight much slower, and only the longer to run near as efficient. So we can use the fit principle and keep track of these other variables, specificity and reversibility, and we can design a program that you can incorporate into your daily life where you'll have increases in fitness which means you defend better against disease, that's less time being sick, that's better quality of life, more quantity of life, live longer, all those things seem like they're really great things, right? We do have to identify that there are some limits to adaptability. So 
there are some limits to adaptability. And one of the biggest limits to adaptability is individual differences. So individual differences. Um, if we were to survey the entire class, and we were just to ask, how fast can you run a mile? We're going to probably see 440-ish up towards maybe about 10 minutes. And some of you are like, well, I don't run a 440, but you may not have the same genetics. And you might be kind of out of luck. Now, you can probably improve, but you probably aren't going to be able to have that same level of adaptability. So what are the reasons that we have these individual differences that affect this ability to improve fitness? Well, one of the big things is called your genome. Your genetics affects your ability to respond. Your genetics affects your ability to resist disease. Some of you may just simply be more disease resistant because you have beneficial genetic information. Some of you might be disease prone because you have adverse genetic information. And even though there are some gene editing tools that are available that we can actually maybe begin to realistically change some genetic information in an individual, it's not something that we're going to routinely use. And you got to just live with the genetics that you're getting. Now, does that mean that you're destined to be a couch potato? No, probably not. But there are some biological controls that are going to probably affect your ability to improve fitness, your ability and desire to be physically active. And we need to know about those things. Those are important. There's also individual differences in our ability to change our body composition. Body size and body mass and body height and all these characteristics uh, you know, that we look at, oh yeah, she's well, 5.5. It's defined by hundreds of different genes. So the ability to lose weight for some individuals, you may have a friend, a parent, a brother or sister who just doesn't lose weight even if they exercise and they eat well. But guess what? They're getting better fitness as they do those things, especially as they participate in exercise. So even though there are these individual dif differences, there's still very good reason to participate in routine daily physical activity and exercise. We also see individual differences in sports skills. Growing up, Everybody looked at me, and I was this big, long, tall, lanky kid. I was going to be a great basketball player. Guess what? I have no eye-hand coordination. I can't dribble a ball, but I can run pretty fast, and I was really fast on cross skills. So we have these individual differences. I was never going to be, I was never going to be a great basketball player, but I skied it on an NCAA Division One cross country. So there's a massive difference in the ability to develop different sports skills. All right, so taking all of that in stride, how can we start an exercise program? How can we make our physical activity and exercise that we're accumulating on a daily basis more effective? and achieving better physical fitness and better health in disease resistance. So this is the sort of DIY network version of exercise plan. Now, what I'm not telling you to do is just to start exercising and come back and say, gosh, I hurt myself, but you told me to exercise. Nope, I'm just giving you information. I'm not telling you to do anything, just telling you the information and you need to make an, your own decision on that information. Go and talk to your doctor. For some of you, it might be important to gain some medical experience. Having someone kind of give you some information about your current health status is always very beneficial. And it's going to play into how you go through this developmental process. 
So first and foremost, gain medical clearance. Most of you are probably hopefully getting yearly physicals and the doctor is not going to tell you to hold up your hair You probably should just get home, get five chips, TV. Most of you are going to say, yeah, most of your doctors are going to say, yes, that would be great. Get some exercise. It is medicine. The next step will be to undergo fitness assessment. And this is the idea of taking stock from where we are currently. What is our current fitness level? Okay, it's good to get that information. So we're going to undergo some sort of fitness assessment. So a couple examples of fitness assessment. We might measure our one mile run time. In that one mile run time, what does that assess? What, what, what um, component of what health limit component of fitness for the one mile run time assess? Current cardiorespiratory endurance fitness. You can do uh, one rep max for several different muscle groups. And that's going to help you out with an assessment of muscle strength. For muscle, or I'm sorry, muscle endurance. Uh, muscle strength, yeah, I said it correctly the first time. Muscle strength, and then for muscle endurance, you can perform push ups. Look at the max number of push ups, pull ups. Maybe even wall sits. Use those different tests to assess your endurance capabilities, your muscle endurance capabilities. So once you've kind of taken stock of where you are, now the goal is going to be how can I improve? How can I gain additional physical fitness? It's always good to set some realistic goals. And so you might say, all right, in six months, I want to improve my one mile run time by one minute. So there's a very specific goal. We've got a target. Now we've got to design the program to achieve that goal. And so we're going to select activities. And as we're selecting activities, one, they should be goal specific or they should relate well to your goal, but they should also be activities that are going to develop health. And also develop skill, which really are both components of fitness that collect, right? Health and skills equals fitness. So for a one mile run, increasing our one mile run time by one minute, I probably am not going to want to choose to just exclusively go and measure. Probably not going to be very beneficial. So that's probably not going to be the best activity. It might be one of the activities that you choose, but we're going to, we're going to want to get in some sort of cardiorespiratory endurance training as well. All right, so after we've sort of selected the activity, by the way, select the activities that you really enjoy. Um, if you hate running, then don't run. Find a bike to ride, find a boat to paddle, find a kid to walk. I don't know. Do something else besides what you absolutely hate. Because if you hate it, you're only going to last a short amount of time before you're like, oh, I'm okay. All right. From here, we're going to use the FIT principle to organize and to plan. So we're going to use the FIT principle to organize and plan how to go from current level of fitness to your goal. Okay? When you get back here on Monday, we have the exam. On Wednesday, we'll pick back up with the rest of this material.